Okay, this panel is on supporting diversity in sapphic literature. And I'm going to introduce a very um, interesting group we have here representing all kinds of diversity. And, and that was that's one of the questions. I mean, what is diversity? But we won't go there. Okay, I'm going to start with Tegan Shepard, who's on the left. Tegan uses she, her pronouns, and is the author of sapphic fiction, including the 2019 Goldie winner, Bird on a Wire. When not writing about extraordinary women loving other extraordinary women, she can be found playing video games, reading, or sitting in a D.C. metro traffic. She lives in... <laughs> She lives in Virginia with her wife and two ridiculous cats. Uh, the next person up is Kay Acker. Kay Acker grew up in Northern Alabama and lives in Southern Vermont with her wife. They play tabletop games with friends and enjoy the daily antics of two cats. The first queer romance novel Kay read was found in a public library and hidden in their room until well after the due date. They now borrow, read, and write queer books openly. Their first lot novel, Leaving's Not the Only Way to Go, was released by Bella Books in 2021. It is a contemporary romance about how the memories two women hold on to most tightly affect. Let me start again. It's a contemporary not romance about how the memories two women hold on to most tightly affect their visions of the future. Okay, on going on the other side, we have Felice Cohen. Felice is known globally as the woman who lived in one of the world's smallest apartments. She's the award-winning author of the best-selling book, Half In, a coming-of-age memoir of forbidden love. The award-winning 90 Lessons for Living Large, large in a 90, 90 square feet or more, and what Papa told me. Okay. And last but not least, we have Anne Shade, who tells me she's an incurable romantic with passion for writing stories about women who love women. Whether it's contemporary, erotica, historical intrigue, or fantasy, Anne's stories cross many genres with one common factor, BIPOC representation in all her main characters. When Anne isn't writing, she's coordinating dream weddings and daydreaming about plans for her future bed and breakfast. Okay, so given that, we'll get started. Uh, the first question we're going to ask may be the hardest. I don't know. What are some risks, risks you have taken or mistakes that have you have made when exploring diversity? Should I ask for a volunteer? No? All right, I'll start with taking. Starting with me, because I've made so many mistakes. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, the one that sticks out for me is um, in, uh, I have two books that have a Latinx lead character. Uh, and in the first one, um, I italicized my Spanish, um, which, and for, if you don't know, um, most uh, authors and Latinx authors and um, uh, uh, wider words hard, activists, there you go, um, advocate for not italicizing Spanish uh, in our text. Um, part of the reason is that it's confusing um, because uh, italics are often used for emphasis. So you're emphasizing a word that's not meant to be emphasized, but mostly it's because it's really othering. Um, we live in a country where a lot of folks speak Spanish. Um, and if you treat your book that every word that is not English is literally othered by being in a different font, um, it's, it doesn't feel good for those people. Um, so the way I found out about that, unfortunately, uh, was in a review, uh, and not just any review, it was Tara Scott in, uh, Smart Bitches Trashy Books. Uh, so finding out you made a really big mistake from like one of the biggest names in our genre, not fun, <laughs> not fun, but I learned a lot. Um, and that's, that's the important part. Um, so in my second book, I didn't make the same mistake. And I actually got to have really great conversations with uh, my editor and my publisher who were extremely supportive. Um, so I feel like I was able to pass that lesson on. Um, boy, do I wish I had found out before I published that book. Um, but it's still, it was, uh, you know, it was a mistake I made. I actually learned a lot from. So. Um, so I would say that uh, among the, as Tegan said, various mistakes that I've made, uh, the one that came to mind here was 
uh, a conversation with a friend of mine. Uh, her name is Nellie. Uh, she's in her 50s and she's one of my really dearest friends. And we were talking about GCLS and the conversation around uh, the terminology that has changed and how that works. And I started going into the history, you know, starting with, oh, so in the in the 90s, da, 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 da. And she put her hands up and she said, I know I was there. <laughs> and I realized that because she's been married to a man the whole time that I've known her, I full out forgot that she's bisexual. And, uh, you know, it, it would have been easy to sort of let that one go. Uh, thankfully, I, I was, uh, because I trust Nellie so much, I was able to say, hey, I'm sorry I did that. Um, and, you know, I would love to hear more from you about your experience, what you've been through, and thankfully, screwing up in this way, uh, let me learn more about someone I really love. And so as we're talking about this topic and the vision for it, I think that's what I hope that everyone here can have the opportunity to do, uh, is to make that mistake and get to know someone better for it. Okay, oh, thank you. All right, we'll go to this side. Um, I think as far as risks, I think it was being on this panel. Um, <laughs> and, I, and I joke, but I'm also kind of serious. I think today we're so afraid of saying the wrong thing, um, of offending anyone. You know, we talk about, you know, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. This book is now, you know, you can't say certain words in it. I guess somebody was described as enormously fat. You can't say that. You, there are so many words you can't say that I'm so afraid of saying anything now. Um, and, and I think that kind of puts us at a little disadvantage because I think we shouldn't be afraid. I think we should understand why people want to be certain pronouns. I think we should understand how we want to be, you know, how African-American, Black, Jewish. I hate when people say, oh, you're a Jew. I hate that um, because my grandparents were in the Holocaust. And, and so there are words that come up, but I think we need to have... I think we need to be able to have a dialogue around it without people getting offended so quickly. We talk about, we can't even talk about politics in our families now. And I think it, it just raises this, this question of, we need to really understand where we're coming from, but we have to be empathetic um, in, in what we're saying. And, and we can't be so afraid to speak because I think we're getting to that point where it's scary to be able to say anything. There's cancel culture and and all the stuff. And, and I don't want to say the wrong thing. Um, I don't want to offend anyone, but I also want to understand where everyone is coming from because I want everyone to feel comfortable with, with who they are. Um, I'm hoping this doesn't sound facetious, but I don't think I've done anything wrong or taken risk or anything. I think I've been as bold as I possibly can, especially with putting a uh, black face on my cover, which you don't even see in many of the general genre fiction books um, by uh, um, queer authors. Um, I think my biggest probably regret was worrying that, and this is gonna sound, hopefully this doesn't sound bad, there are too many white people reading my books and not enough black people. Okay, that's, that's my biggest thing is that I, and I found, I realized that at the conference this year or last year where I had many people and I'm not saying don't come up to me and tell me you like my book. Cause I, please, I have, <laughs> I, I have a complex where I think this, I don't, I can't write that well. No one's going to like my books, but to not to have, there were 13 African-American people at that conference and to have every person come up to me be a white person and not one of those, I think only one person who's here came up to me <laughs> and and said something to me was very disappointing to me. And I felt like I'd done something, I hadn't done the right, I hadn't done what I was supposed to do because I'm not getting the readers that I think should be reading this. But I had to realize that any reader reading it is someone who should be reading it. It's something that you know, you guys can learn about someone within my community and people within my community already know what we've gone through, but that doesn't mean you don't read from another author that's of the same um, ethnicity that you are. If there's a Jewish person that wrote a romance and you're a Jewish person, read it. This, you, you never know, support your community um, and support other authors outside of that. But I think that was my biggest 
thing. It's not so much of a risk or a, a doing anything wrong. Was just being upset that I had so many white folks reading my books. <laughs> Sounds so ridiculous saying it now. <laughs> well, just as a follow up, how do you handle that? How have you handled any of these mistakes? Um, doing panels like this, um, trying to get the word out, um, trying to get my publisher to do more um, for getting for marketing towards and that's the problem a lot of the smaller publishers don't know how to market to our community and it turns out i'm going to have to be the one to do it um and which i don't mind um it's just it was it wasn't what i prepared to do i joined the publisher in house i'm thinking okay my publisher is going to do all this work for me you know when i was self published i was doing all the work and i got tired of that which is why i went to a publisher and my publisher is great i mean they got me involved in In Our Words, which is a anthology that Bullstroke Books did for BIPOC with BIPOC writers. Um, but there's more that has to be done. And I'm I have now, you know, being handed the mantle to be the one to do it. And I was saying earlier, I was born on Malcolm X's birthday. I had a militant uncle who made sure I knew that. And I grew up a very militant proper young girl from Chicago, you know, <laughs> I spoke very well. I spoke very proper, but don't say anything wrong. Don't drop the certain word and you will see something else come out. And so I realized that I'm going to have to be the Malcolm X <laughs> of, of trying to get more of my, um, ethno, of my people to write and to read within that genre. You can add, if I could just say real quick, I think that uh, this is a great space to talk about that and how much extra emotional labor we place, uh, especially on our BIPOC authors, um, to do that work for, like, you know, those of us who are white, we, they, they reach our audience. You know, there were 13 Black members at the, uh, at the G Celeste Con last year. That's the largest number of Black attendees we've ever had. The, these experiences that, you know, that our BIPOC authors go through are so ex extremely white. And then they have to have that extra thing on top of you have to go out and find your community. I think that it's, this is an opportunity for, for us white authors to take some of that load, to do some of that work too, to, to, to find some of those spaces and to, you know, if you're, we're doing pride events coming up soon, right? It's June's coming up make sure you're supporting your, your BIPOC authors too, because you, and we end up seeing, I know at DC pride, we saw a lot of folks who were there who were BIPOC. And last year, unfortunately, we didn't have any BIPOC authors books to sell them. And we're, we fixed that mistake for this year. Um, so I, I encourage folks to, to see what Anne is saying and, and try and take some of that emotional labor away. So I was going to ask the rest of the panel to answer the question of, you know, how do you hand or how have you handled any of the mistakes you've made? You want to try? Mistakes just about books? Um, no. About, you I, could... I mean, you know, I remember in college um, being with a group and, and I was, I had no idea about my sexuality yet. And, and I made a comment about Elton John and Bernie Taupin. And as soon as I, I made some off the cuff remark, I realized that these other guys in our group were gay. And I just remember thinking, whoa. And I, I felt horrible about it. And it's kind of always stayed with me. You know, you're afraid to say the wrong thing and, and saying things, but, um, you know, I do a lot of panels on the Holocaust and on, um, and now just about writing memoir. And I mean, I, I think when I was writing about, you know, I'm not creating characters. There are people that were in my life that I'm writing about. And, and I had um, a writer's group in one of my stories. And the woman was a professor, uh, assistant professor at Smith, and she was black. And and when I went to describe her, I remember thinking, how am I going to describe her in the book? And I was Googling and talking to other authors. I didn't want to offend. I didn't want to say. And, and so I remember reading some, I think she was a professor in another school said, don't say, you know, describe her skin as the color of milk chocolate. And it was very, and it was offensive. And I thought, 
wow, okay, that I'm, I'm learning this. And, and it was about how to describe people different from ourselves. And, you know, when you're describing people, you always want to say the hair color and the eye color. And, but you want to do more than that. You want to go deeper and you want to be sensitive to this. And, and I think the internet has been helpful Googling and, and reading what people say about it, but also talking to other authors um, and to find out and to readers and how do you want to be described or, and, and really asking, I think, um, you know, that's important. Okay, how about the other side? How did you handle any of these mistakes? Um, yeah, so definitely something to be said for apologizing, apologizing and following up with tell me more, but also I think uh, just listening to what's already being said because these conversations are happening everywhere and you can find them and you can, without having to as as Tegan was was saying, ask uh, the people involved who are affected by these issues to sit down and explain it to you. Just listen, and and hear what you can learn without having to make anyone else do any extra work. Yeah, I, was, I mean, I basically already said, and and I agree with that. It's um, it it is it's our our instinct when we make a mistake to be defensive. Um, and I think that it is so, so important to move away from that and to, to take opportunities to learn. Um, if you say something wrong, you don't need to tell people why you said it wrong, <laughs> right? Let them tell you, apologize, listen to what they have to say. Um, but I, I'd say back away from that impulse to defend yourself and um, because it's not, uh, it's not helpful in that situation. I think um, it's a, it's, it's what, what I try to do. And it is hard. It is definitely hard to do that. Um, but that's, I think that's really, really key. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The next question is, has your writing been tokenized or marginalized in the Sapphic community? And how do you cope with that? And we'll start on this side. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm going to have a hard time pulling it out after a while. Um, so I don't know that this is, is tokenization exactly, but I have had a sort of odd experience. Um, uh, one of the main characters in my novel and her daughter are both autistic. Um, and I put a lot of work into getting that right as someone who has uh, a cousin disorder to autism, but I'm not actually autistic myself. Um, and because there are so few books out there, I keep getting asked to speak on it. And I have to be very careful about not taking up space that I don't belong in. Uh, I had someone who was working, thankfully, uh, working on a, a novel herself uh, that, with an autistic character. And she said, hey, Kay, can you uh, read this for me and tell me what you think? And I started to say, yeah, of course. And then I stopped and I said, no, actually, but I can tell you who helped me and they may be able to help you. Uh, so not being the wrong kind of token, not being in the, in the wrong place uh, has been a, a, an experience that I've worked with. Yeah, I'd say on the, on the marginalized end, um, I write a lot of bisexual and pansexual characters. Um, my my wife is bisexual, and so it's really important to me um, to and basically everything that she's ever encountered with a, a bisexual character has a negative stereotype. Um, it's a huge problem in mainstream media, but also honestly in our genre. Um, I cannot tell you how many sapphic romances I've read that have really harmful stereotypes about bisexual women and uh, pansexual uh, folks. And um, so I uh, have definitely not had the best time with that. There's actually, there's a, uh, my favorite review I have on Goodreads is for Swipe Right. Um, and it literally says, uh, I don't like this book because I want my lesbian books to have two lesbians in them. I'm like, wh what do you do with that? Right. It's the, nothing about the story. You just don't like the fact that I think pansexual and bisexual people are valid. Okay. Um, I, so how do I cope with it? Uh, oh, I stopped reading reviews. Uh, <laughs> um, 
but I uh, there's not a lot else I can do because uh, I'm not going to stop writing by and pan characters. Um, it was hugely important for me to see myself as a butch woman, as a butch lesbian portrayed positively in uh, on the page. And I think that by and pan folks deserve that too. Um, so just kind of smile and nod and walk away. <laughs> okay. How about this side? What, um, has your writing been tokenized or marginalized in the sapphic community? I believe it's been marginalized. Um, I don't think where there was also, where there were people, where there were, see, I hate to say, where there were white people <laughs> who liked my book, there are also those who look at the cover and are like, oh, that's not something I want to read because they think there's a black person on the cover. Why are they going to read that? They're not going to equate with that person. I'm like, well, maybe you were in the Marines. This character was in the Marines. Um, maybe you live in Oklahoma and this, on a farm. This character lives in Oklahoma and has a ranch. So you can't judge literally a book by its cover. Um, and I think that's where the issue lies with, and, and my mom said, well, Leslie, what? Government name, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> why, do you, why don't you just put just a nice picture on the cover? Why would you, why you need to put a black person on the cover? Okay, mom. <laughs> I don't know. I like to see myself on the cover. <laughs> So I, I think because of the books that don't have, I've noticed the book that, that don't have an actual person on the cover is are doing better than the ones with the person on the cover. Other than my very first one, Femtales. Everything else, this one, I'm getting good reviews on it, but the sales aren't what they are. Love and Lotus Blossom, which just has a Lotus Blossom on the cover, is like up there because there's no identifying person on the cover. Um, and I'm assuming my next one, Three Wishes, because it just has a magic lamp on it, is probably going to be the same way. But then the one coming up in November has three Black women on the cover. So we'll see <laughs> if that is the case. Um, but I, I think that's because of what I write and how I write. I think it's being marginalized because we have I have my own community here who are like, do I really want to read about something, you know, another person like me or do I want to step out of that bounds? Or, and then I have the other community who were like, well, how am I going to identify with that person? So, um, Well, I write memoir. So um, if you have a heart, <laughs> you might relate to that. Um, so, <laughs> you know, my, my book is about when I was 23 and I had a, uh, this was in the early 90s, I had a secret affair with my boss, a 57-year-old woman. And I only really told the story when the book came out a couple months ago. Um, nobody really knew. I kept it a secret for three decades. And, you know, I know sapphic romance does so well. And the book reads like a romance novel. But because it's memoir, I think sometimes people maybe don't kind of, you know, relate it to, again, a sapphic romance. Um, and it was, <laughs> it was a romance um, that is still affecting me all these years later. But um you know, I remember before this book came out, people said to me, you know, you're known for writing about living in a tiny space or writing about uh, your grandfather. This is a whole other genre. You know, you're 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 brave to tell your your story. And I thought, I'm not brave. You know, my grandparents were, you know, other people or whatever. But the, but telling your story is scary and putting out something very personal. But I felt like I had no choice and I didn't care about what people were going to think. Um, this was something I had to tell in order to kind of move on with my own, with my own life and, uh, and wanting to tell the story. Okay. Uh, what is, uh, what issues do you feel get marginalized the most? Do you want to try here? Uh, what gets marginalized the most? Um, I don't know. I think you can just be put in um, an LGBTQ category and that's, you know, dismissed. You can be put in a, a self-published book and that can be dismissed. I think people are so quick to kind of put everybody in some box that they're not willing to try it. And, and I know we were just talking earlier about Kindle Unlimited, which is a great opportunity to try new books you might not have um, wanted to try before and just try to open yourself up to read things that you might not have read. I mean, I love Goodreads, you know, what are my friends reading? What are other people reading? 
and you know judging a book by its cover yeah we we judge immediately they say you have three seconds to make an impact with your cover um and and maybe we need to kind of look outside that box and and lead by example with ourselves um and then maybe we you know write down on goodreads try this book i never would have thought to read it um and try to you know start that way um i think it's it's at least in my case it's being queer and black that's that's i think that community is not even within the community within the black community being queer and black is not easy um it's 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 bad enough that you have to fight with the world about who you are and how you identify but then you have to fight with your own people about who you are and identify and i think when you're writing a story about that and then there are people out there saying either not admitting to themselves that they are. Um, it took me till I was 40 something years old, mid forties to finally admit to myself, this is who I am. Um, and I'm embracing it fully now, you know, 10 years later, I'm like, hey, this is me. But there are people out there that aren't like that. And they don't wanna read something, you know, they, they're reading in the dark. They're not gonna tell friends about it. They're not, you know, if they're not out to themselves. So I think that it's so marginalized within that community that it's difficult to really push my my stories out there. I mean, do you think it's harder when it's marginalized within your community than when it's outside your community? Yes, yeah. yes. Um, when you're, especially in the African-American community, when you're already fighting with the world, trying to be heard, trying not to be killed, not to be, you know, all the things that are happening to us, it's even more difficult to have it within your community when they're you're not being heard. I mean, African American communities are rife with people who won't go to therapy because you know you you, you should be able to fix yourself. You know, you 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 shouldn't be talking to somebody that's white people stuff. You know, mm -hmm. so it's it's difficult to fight your own people when you're fighting yourself and then have to fight the world. It's just it's a lot of fighting going on. <laughs> Does anyone else on the panel have a, a, anything to say about that question? Anyone? Nope. I think, you know, having a community, like we have a community here, so we at least have somebody, but, you know, when you, you first want to go to your own community, um, whether, you know, you're a person of color, whether you're Jewish, whatever you are, you want to at least have someone. Um, and I, I remember my grandfather saying in the Holocaust, after years and years of starvation, he finally found a cousin and he was so thankful. And the cousin worked in the kitchen and he went to go get some food from the cousin and the cousin said, I can't give you any food. And he thought, if my own family won't help me, um, who else will? And, and I think we we have to start with some community, you know, whether it's our family and then it's our friends and then it's people who are like us before we can kind of go out into the, you know, big bad world. Okay. Anyone want to add anything? Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of conversations that it would be interesting for us to have more of talking about things like uh, disability, polyamory, but uh, I do definitely want to underline what Anne is saying in terms of most marginalized. Absolutely. the It's it's authors of color and particularly black authors. <laughs> OK. All right. So I got to go to the next question. Uh, have you discussed your background with other authors? How did it feel to talk about it with authors of different backgrounds? And I guess we're going to go on this one. Uh, yeah, I mean, I I have. Um, I am in, in many ways very fortunate that I don't have as many layers of marginalization uh, as some other folks in the community. Um, I was recently diagnosed neurodivergent, which is... Um, has become interesting. Uh, it's a lot more of the conversations I'm having now are about um, how my my ADHD and specifically my uh, rejection sensitive dysphoria. Google it. it I, it's too much to talk about, but <laughs> but uh, um, how that affects uh, the the work that I do. And I've had a lot of conversations with other authors around that. Um, but like I said, I mean my my layers of marginalization are are not really. Um, much to speak of, basically. <laughs> um, so I've had uh, a lot of good experiences in talking about um, 
my my background. Actually, I think I I came out as non-binary on a GCLS panel, uh, which was fun. Um, I've talked about um, having ADHD and uh, fibromyalgia um, and a lot of other things. There are other things that I haven't started talking about yet, but because things are going so well, I feel like maybe I could at some point. Um, but I've also, in terms of talking with other authors about their backgrounds, um, I run an event uh, called the Sapphic Story Hour uh, on Zoom and have had the opportunity to have a lot of authors, including uh, Anne, uh, read and answer questions and have had the opportunity to really ask some of the, the harder questions and hopefully to be able to, to keep doing that because you can have some really incredible conversations when you're willing to actually ask. Uh, it's absolutely worth it. How about you guys? I'm really thinking about this um, question. Um, I don't know if it's so much diversity, but um, I'm doing a talk with Rita Mae Brown in two weeks, and I went and spent a weekend with her last week. And we just spent the day together. Just I really just listened to her, just talk, talk, talk. She had so much to say. She was amazing. And, you know, talk about brave. Like she was just, she would just off the cuff tell me about when, when Ruby Fruit Jungle came out and she was shot at. She had tomatoes and eggs thrown at her and she was just threatened and all these things. And I thought, you know, she, it was, she was the one who started all this really. I mean, her book really kind of set the stage and I was, you know, thanking her for, for taking, being brave and writing that story and writing that book. And she just is just so spunky and just said, you know, I, I just wanted to, I love writing stories about people who stand up for themselves. And, you know, she wrote about a lot of character a lot of characters, excuse me, in her book. And she just wanted to tell that story. And thankfully she did and, and put up with a lot for us to be able to uh, sit here and to be able to, you know, talk about our struggles and our writing. And at the end of the day, really, we, we get to do what we love to do. So um, we're thankful for that, I'm sure, but still not always easy. I think, um, and as far as, and Tegan mentioned this, by being bisexual within this community years ago was very difficult because it's all the, you know, you can't have your cake and eat it too. And, you know, um, lesbians need to be lesbians. You have to be black or white, lesbian or straight. Or, so there was none of that happy medium. Um, I found within this community since I've started writing that it's okay. That being bisexual is not a curse. It's not, um, you know, this, you're, you're greedy kind of thing. It's, this is, this is me. This is who I am. I, you know, I love me. Um, I love my spouse and I've been married to a man for 26 years and proud of it. Um, he's accepted who I am. And if he happened to be a woman, I'd have been married to a woman for 26 years. <laughs> it's just the person that I found. So I've been in, I, I have enjoyed being embraced by the community because there are so many others like me um, and even when Tegan and I, during the, the conference and I met her wife, I was so happy to meet her wife because I was like, oh, another one. <laughs> so it, I think they're being embraced by the community and, and being accepted has been really good for my mental <laughs> stability uh, as a bisexual woman. So. Okay. Um, have you ever feared being insensitive or inauthentic in these conversations? No, um, <laughs> I, I will, when it comes to, prom not promoting, but when it comes to speaking out about um, BIPOC queer people, um, I am Malcolm X, <laughs> um, I am Martin, um, I am Maya, I am anybody who needs to be anybody to be heard. Um, this is, I, I will speak out in a minute. Um, I will if I have to be the only, I say chocolate chip in the cookie, I will be the only chocolate chip in the cookie. If I have to be the only one on the panel, which happens far too often, I'm usually the only person of color on panels. Um, and it's not that there are no right all uh, BIPOC authors out there. There are a ton of them. I met at least 10 of them at the conference. <laughs> but 
if I have to be the only one, I'll be the only one. I'll be the token. I'll be the one to set the bar um, and I'll be the one to represent and I'll do it proudly. Um, tomorrow, I've got an all day panel about the Holocaust. Um, so I get to switch uh, genres. But, you know, I grew up on Cape Cod and I always felt more preppy than Jewish. And uh, as you can see, I'm not wearing socks, but um, I, you know, growing up and, and I was not really always talking about being Jewish, being afraid of people knowing I was Jewish to talk about that. Not that I thought the Holocaust would happen again, but anti-Semitism um, is on the rise, as we know. So I when my, my grandfather's book came out, suddenly I wasn't really talking about me. I was talking about my grandfather and and what he went through. And suddenly I was proud that I was Jewish and that this was my grandfather and what he had done. And so, you know, I've spoken to tens of thousands of people around the country about being Jewish and about his story. And it every time I would speak to a whole school, I'd walk into an assembly hall and I, some, I, sometimes I might have been the only one, maybe there were one or two students who were Jewish, and I, I suddenly was happy to be talking about it. And, and it, excuse me, really just changed my outlook on how I felt about it and how I approached it. Um, and, you know, it made me feel, feel better about it. And I think it's, it's in the talking, it's in the telling. We have to keep talking about it to make us feel better and more comfortable. Okay. How about you guys over here? Um, you know, like I said, yes, but it's every time that I've done it, it's paid off. So it's worth it. Yeah, I would say I'm definitely afraid, uh, but I think that's a healthy fear. Um, be, having that fear kind of um, makes us take ownership of our stories. Um, you know, there was a, I was, Kay and I had a, a, a interaction. We, I, we did a book together, um, a short story book with Bella Books called uh, Save the Date. Um, and it's short stories about weddings and stuff. Um, so one of the things I really wanted to do, this was 2020, I think it has been a few years ago. I really wanted to include, uh, pronouns in everyone's biography. Um, and that, you know, that wasn't something that you see as often then as you do now. Um, and so I, I asked everyone to provide their pronouns. Um, and Kay at the time was just kind of on that, in that journey, um, uh, of, of her not and their non-binary journey, excuse me. Um, so actually asking for pronouns at that time actually put a lot of pressure on Kay that they weren't really ready to talk about and think about. And so, so having some of those conversations that are difficult where they were like, look, I'm not really there. And, you know, and, and I think I'm doing something good for folks who are, who are trans and non-binary and in the end, it ended up putting more pressure on them um, that they weren't ready to take that step. But it was so informative. We, you know, we had a really great conversation around it, I think. Um, and, uh, and, and it's made me more thoughtful and intentional in the future. And I think that's the key to when you're, when you're dealing with writing diversity and dealing with diversity is being thoughtful and being intentional. And I will say that, that being part of that conversation on the other side of it, it, it allowed me to have an opportunity to talk and think about it more. So even though it, it was sort of not initially the best choice, op being open to that conversation was really helpful. Okay, now you took my other question, which was how did it how did it feel to provide this information? There you go. <laughs> okay. I think you feel you answered already. We'll go to the other uh, side of the table. To provide the information for well, when people ask you for your background, or no, I'm sorry, when people ask you for help in research. Oh, um, I've I've been a beta reader for a couple of people, and which I appreciated them asking. I would rather them have asked than to go ahead and just write something they shouldn't have. Um, one in particular didn't realize that during a certain time period, um, there weren't many black people named Madeline. So her character's name was Maddie for short, but her full name was Madeline. This is during 1940s. There weren't any black people named Madeline in the 1940s. Um, so I suggested look up censor records, you know, go and send, you know, go, go and look up some records, look up um, uh, historical you know, figures, see what the names are and then go from there. Um, so I appreciate when they come to me because I would rather correct them and give them the correct information and have them be able to 
put that put a good piece of work out there than to just like make up something and you know using her skin was the color of a Hershey bar and <laughs> yeah you don't use food things to describe um to describe African American folks um although I will sometimes use caramel or honey but to get the point but I I think it's very helpful to to give that information I don't know if I've been asked too much about um, reading for that. I mean, I, I do help people when they are trying to craft their memoirs and their books and put that together. Um, just trying to help give feedback on that. But um, yeah, I mean, it is so helpful to, to just talk to someone. Everybody's willing to talk about themselves. <laughs> so if you just say, Hey, you know, what, how, how would you describe that? I mean, you know, you're Italian. How do you describe, you know, your mother's gravy or whatever? I mean, in asking somebody who, who knows. Right. See, gravy. I dated someone who was time. Okay, now we only have a few minutes left, but I did want to ask, are you currently dealing with any of these issues in your writing? And I, since I didn't tell you that one in advance, you don't have to answer it, but do you have any anything you want to say about that? Uh, yeah, I the book that I am slowly working on, uh, one of the characters has ADHD and one of them has fibromyalgia. Uh, I thought at first, oh, maybe that's too much for a book. And then I thought, well, it's it's me. I'm here. So I'm doing it. Sure. Anything else that anyone would like to add on the panel? If not, I thought I saw some hands going up. Do we have any questions? Okay. Yeah, I have a question for anybody on the panel. Um, how much of this do you think might be generational? as far as comfort or discomfort with um, uh, uh, different ways of describing people. And for instance, take, take and you talk about Latinx and a very, very close, someone who's very close to me is, uh, she would describe herself as Latina and loathes the, the thing Latinx. So, you know, you sort of, as a writer, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. And some of this, I get the feeling, may be generational, which leads me to the whole thing. Everybody on this panel, nobody's discussed ageism with the Pacific uh, communities writing. So I'd like to hear some of this address, both in terms of you know approaching pronouns and 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 uh, ethnic titles and so on, and the whole notion of aging. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I I would say one of the things I talk about. I, I teach a, a class on um, on writing diversity. Um, I've done it a few times in the GCLS space. Um, I have a master class. Um, one of the things that I make a really big point about is that there is a very different experience for say a twenty year old bisexual and a fifty year old bisexual. Um, you know, so so a, a lot of times, and and I specifically say about Latinx, make sure, and and this is a good thing to use in uh in everyday conversation letting people tell you how they identify is a very good idea because a lot of folks don't like the term latinx um, yeah i mean it's the same thing there's a there's a lot of folks uh in our community who do not like to be called queer um and that again is a generational thing um i i definitely embrace that term for myself um <laughs> right. Yeah. But there are some folks who get, who are very upset about it. So again, it's, I think it's a lot about, um, and when you're talking about character, um, I would find it very unlikely that say like a, a 50 plus year old, uh, Latina woman would use the term Latinx unless there is someone in her life who, um, has some sort of, um, some sort of, uh, uh, place with under the trans and non-binary um, or even the queer umbrella. Um, a lot of queer folks who who um, who are don't identify as trans or non-binary um, use Latinx in, in, uh, in that way. Um, but I would say that if it's a 20 year old, uh, it's going to be very different. Now, are you you're never going to satisfy every reader, right? Um, but I think that as long as you are um, authentic to the character and what is more likely, um, then I think that's that's the best you you can go with. Have more than one and let them talk about it is <laughs> my suggestion. Any other comments or questions? Oh, I'm sorry. So I think the same issue happens with African American characters, or so people don't. Should I say black? Should I say African American? There's I there's two things I say. 
don't use either of the n-words that's all i say you can use black you can use african-american don't say negro don't say colored those are the, the ones you don't say and don't say that one word you have to go with what was at the time so colored was more common in the in the early early years and even Negro was more color, but only use that with if you're using it within those contexts of a historical novel. If you are not black or African American, it's perfectly fine or person of color. Um, so just just keep that in mind if you're going to write out of you know uh, if you're going to write a character of color. Yeah, but the problem also is that even within the African American community, we don't know what to call ourselves. Yeah. <laughs> so I you know people ask me, oh I'm. I'm a person of color or I'm an author of color or I'm a black author. Or I, I use all of it. So it's, it's, it really depends on what you feel more comfortable using. But those two phrases, person of color, black person, keep it within that, <laughs> in that range. But when I read something or I'm talking to someone and they use a term like Latinx, to me, that's an indicator that this is someone who's done some work. So if I'm talking to someone who's white or I'm reading someone who's white, and I read that, I'm like, okay, this is someone who I can, who's safe. Someone who I don't have to worry is going to call the black person, say their, their complexion is chocolate or something. So those are the things that, to me, that's an indicator. Yeah, because like you said, everybody doesn't do it. But when I see it, I go, okay. I know that if you're on top of this, then you're on top of these other five things that matter to me as well. So. Okay. I mean, I could address the ageism. Um, you know, I, when I was 23 and, and I was having this affair with a 57 year old woman, one of the reasons I kept it so secret because I was so ashamed because she was so much older. And now that I'm 52, I'm thinking 57 is nothing. Um, but when you're 23, you know, you're just out of diapers and you know, you're, it just, it just was hard for me, but I, I was aware of that writing that but writing that character and, and not saying that she was old, but I knew that there were differences in our age by how we walked, by the music we listened to. And, um, you know, I was sensitive to that definitely throughout the whole thing. Okay, any any other comments? Okay. Yeah, Butch, Butch for Butch, Butch. Are, are very rare. I, I would even say it is very hard to find a truly Butch character. Um, and, and this is no shade on folks who are, who, who don't Butch like I Butch, right? <laughs> but like, um, like, like I think about like oh, Winona Earp, right? If you ever watch that show, like I'm seeing, it's, oh, it's a cop. She's like, butch, it's cool. And then she shows up at the party in a ball gown. I'm like, that's not butch. And there's too much of that, I think. And uh, we don't have like, like, I don't own a ball gown. You know, <laughs> like I own men's jeans, right? Like, so, so yeah, but butch for butch is so, so rare. Uh, Femtales has a lovely butch in it, um, Ebony. So, and Paige is is more of soft butch, but she's a butch. She wouldn't wear a ball gown. So, I I and I'm slowly working on trying to get two butch characters together. So I got you. And both of these books are available at the Sapphic Lit Pop Up Books. <laughs> All right. So I guess on that positive note, we've had a good time here and thank you all for coming. <laughs>